the, the ceremony is get easier because you practice them. But uh, the fact of what that symbolizes doesn't get easier. I mean, there's still families that we're leaving. There's still soldiers that are going to go into harm's way. You know, it's combat operations are ending in Afghanistan, but it's still an area of active hostilities. The, the actual ceremony, sure, it gets easier. What it symbolizes never gets easier. As I understand it, you're going to be the or one of the U.S. faces of the train advise assist mission in Afghanistan? So the, the train advise assist face, uh, if you put it that way, is probably more appropriate applied to what we call these train advise and assist command commanders. Those are really the faces if you look at the Afghan corps and then of course at the ISAF soon to be Resolute Support Headquarters level there's advisory teams that work with the ministries. So the easiest way for me to sum up the mission uh, for U.S. Forces Afghanistan and the Resolute Support mission is really connecting the corps to the ministry to help build some institutional capacity that's going to sustain them uh, for years to come. I'm just curious, how do you define assist? Assist, I think, depends on the day, it depends on the person, it depends on the subject. It could be logistics, it could be teaching them how to accurately track what is broken, what is not broken. In this case, it may just be teaching them how to track expenditures and be able to accurately forecast expenditures for a coming year so we can connect that core back to the ministry and help the ministry build budgets for the cores and, and accurately predict future expenditures. As you well know, Afghanistan is a land that is known where nothing comes easy. Right. What do you see as your greatest challenge? The biggest challenge I think is going to be in the mindset of soldiers because we're not out on patrol with Afghan battalions and, and brigades and companies and platoons anymore. We're trying to teach, the, teach them what is in many ways the hardest thing for us is the institutional skills and how you sustain yourself over time. About 60 percent of who I'm taking with me have been to Afghanistan before. This is an entirely different mission. So getting them not to rely on what they learned the last rotation or the rotation before that and kind of look at this differently. And this is about making the Afghans successful and not for the next fighting season, but for the next 10 or 12 fighting seasons. Okay, so help me understand. We are already deeply involved in train, advise, and assist in Operation Enduring Freedom. Now we go to the Resolute Support mission. Is it going to be different, harder? I think it's going to be difficult because you've got you know, a Resolute Support Headquarters, now called ISAF, that for very long time and very much has been focused on the strategic level, the up and out. Now they're going to be focused from the strategic all the way down to the tactical. Is what the cores, the Afghan cores are doing, which, which is very much the tactical level of the fight. The Resolute Support Headquarters now has an operations center, which they never had before, uh, that stood up and functional and running. Um, and I think it's going to develop over the year. I, I don't think the set that I go into is necessarily going to be the set that we end up with. I think that's another thing that we've learned over the last 10 years and we've become very adept at is, is looking at an issue and if something needs to change, we'll make the change to make sure that we're working more efficiently. And as I understand it, train, advise, and assist is just one of the hats that you'll be wearing. And actually, that's probably my most minor role uh, is the train, advise, and assist. So I'm responsible for the Title 10 support working with uh, U.S. Army Central Command, uh, our sent in Kuwait, uh, to, to do the daily logistics, the medical, the feeding, the fueling, the transportation, et cetera, et cetera. From a security standpoint, my sole responsibility right now is the Bagram Security Zone, so what goes on on Bagram and around Bagram and maintain the security there, which you know is a major airfield. And then the train advise assist. My involvement with the tax, I think, will be making sure they have what they need. The daily touches, to make sure that force protection is right, to make sure that you know how we're operating is right, and then probably going back to General Campbell and, and making recommendations on changes as we go forward. Back here, you're still involved in modernizing, training, you're involved in the regionally aligned forces. So is this the state of affair for divisions now? You know, and I've told, <laughs> when the chief came down, when General Campbell came down before he was announced, um, they made trips down to make sure that this was this was right to take a division commander because first brigade will pick up the european raft mission and for the next probably two years they'll be rotating back and forth to europe my fourth brigade is going to jrtc this summer then they will most likely pick up the africom uh, regionally aligned force mission third brigade they are currently the northcom uh, regionally aligned force 
the Aviation Brigade is just now coming out of reset, so they, I'm almost certain they will get a mission here pretty soon. Iraq? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, wherever they're needed, um, we'll see. Is it too much to ask? I don't think so. We have spent a lot of time and effort making sure that we've got the right people in the right spots. And, and so dealing with the plan, I'm very, very comfortable with. But, you know, the plan sometimes doesn't work out to be reality. And so we'll see what changes over the year. But I am exceptionally comfortable going in. This is probably the best prep I've had in my four rotations, even without uh, the traditional uh, mission rehearsal exercise. I'm very comfortable with what's going on back here, with the people we have, with the plan we've got going forward. And we'll get some help. I mean, there's, there's people that want to help, so we'll be fine. Jane and I have been doing this for 32 years. We actually got married on the same day I got commissioned, so she, is, she has been with me every step of the way. I mean, I, I said this many, many times, I think the harder job is back here. You know, Jane does a great job. She did a great job raising kids while I was gone, covering a lot of stuff, but you know, the, the spouse that stays back here becomes mother, father, teacher, coach, mentor, trainer, um, all in all, I mean, it has, it has to do it all. Deployment has become a regular feature in Army families. This is number six for the 3rd Infantry Division since 9-11. When you're deployed, you have a singular focus, and, and you can, you can, and that's important. And soldiers have a singular focus when they're deployed, so they can focus on the job at hand because it is a dangerous place. Uh, but I really do think the harder job is back here. It is. I, I will say I could not be prouder today than to be a military spouse. But surely you get scared. Absolutely, I do. Um, I think about everything every other spouse thinks about. You know, is her husband going to be safe? Um, this will be our fourth deployment. The return to Afghanistan marks yet another deployment for the families of the 3rd Infantry Division, service that serves as a reminder that sometimes duty comes at a heavy cost. Each and every soldier that we've lost over the last 13 years in knock on wood, 468 will be the last number uh, that we'll put in. It's known as Warrior's Walk a tree-lined path established in 2003 to mark the passing of Marne soldiers lost in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we're actually on the, uh, the southern side of the walk right now, which is where it started. Uh, and when this memorial started and General Webster, uh, a couple commanding generals before me, started this, nobody ever envisioned this getting to 468 trees. Um, we started off with eastern redbud trees. We just recently completed replacing uh, every one of these trees with a white flowering crepe myrtle. Um, and the problem was the eastern redbuds were about 100 miles too far south and about 100 miles too far east, and they were dying. The thing that drove me to replace these trees is I did not want a family to drive in, whether it was from Oregon or Little Whiskey, Georgia, and find a dead tree uh, for their soldier. Warrior's Walk stretches along both sides of the division parade field, a half mile in all. At the base of each tree is a name, their unit, a flag. Several have mementos left by families, fellow soldiers, senior army leaders. Sergeant First Class Paul Smith, the first Medal of Honor recipient from Operation Iraqi Freedom, is among those honored here. He's the only Medal of Honor winner from the 3rd Infantry Division, either Iraq and Afghanistan. And, you know, it's, the symbology is really the sacrifice he made for his soldiers. Every day I come in for PT or I'm going home from work or I'll go home to get some lunch or whatever it is, you'll see soldiers over here walking. Many times it's with their squad leader or with a platoon sergeant or with their lieutenant. And they'll go visit trees from soldiers from that unit. And they'll talk about what that soldier did and talk about the sacrifice that these 468 trees represent, not only from the soldier standpoint, but from the family standpoint. It's not the ceremony I wanted to do when I came down here to take 3ID. And it's not the ceremony that I was expecting to do, was case the colors again and take the division back to Afghanistan. However, we're soldiers, and we do what our nation asks us to do. And so that's what we will do. The headquarters of 3rd Infantry Division left for Afghanistan in support of the end of Operation Enduring Freedom and the transition to resolute support. They will return home in a year.